Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lens Podcast with Rujil Rojas. And today's guest is head of social media for K-Swiss. He's a college dropout and has taught himself everything he knows. And when asked why, he said he wanted to, quote unquote, take control of his life. He lives in a positive mindset because, quote unquote, if you want positive things in life, you have to be positive yourself. I'm excited to have Omar Presswich on the show. Omar, thank you so much for coming on. Roger. Dude, thank you. And that intro was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. So for people that don't know, Omar and I uh, became what soon became an acquaintance, a friend and someone that I love watching to see what he's been able to do in such a short period of time at an event in Arizona with our good friend Casey Adams. Mm-hmm. And at that time when we met, I, if I'm not mistaken, you had just been hired. It was less than exactly. 60 days. I don't know if it was 16 days, but it was... No, 60, less than 60. Oh, than yeah, days. absolutely. Yeah, it was just like two months, of, if that. Right, because I remember you talking about that. And now, you know, I, I want for people to get an idea of who you are and then how it came to flourish. And then I would love to talk about the brand itself and the creative direction that you're doing with all these amazing campaigns from Ghostbusters to these online. I saw the gaming shoe. It's just, you know, I'm watching. So it's, it's, it's amazing to witness <laughs> what you're recreating for the brand. Well, I'll do my best to answer anything I can, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun and the team has had a lot of success uh, and putting out amazing, amazing content. Omar, how did you get into creative in the first place? Would you say creative just like photography or... Like- yeah, let, let's start off, let's say photography, yeah, because I know that's a passion of yours aside from uh, the brand yeah. itself. It's something you love to do. So... Um, I got into creative or being a creative on accident, which was um, in college, I was a DJ. Mm-hmm. So DJ, yeah, so DJing was a creative outlet for me. And um, when I realized that I wasn't going to become like, you know, a Diplo or anything like that to the world as a DJ, I decided, hey, I'm not bad at selling and I'm good enough at DJing. Why don't I just start my own record label and a pedal brand? So I started that, and that's really when my journey of being a quote-unquote creative started because Mm -hmm. that was me creating a brand and learning everything I needed to um, on that end, and that was like just a couple years or a few years after Instagram had just started. So I started doing um, photography for the brand because only I had that vision in my mind of what I thought it could be, so I learned how photos and clubs lifestyle i started learning how to design and screen print and stuff like that and create my own apparel um and that's really where my whole journey of a creative started was simply creating a a record label or a brand out of nothing i'd love that and then what was the transition because i do know um there was a point where you kind of you know you brought it up now i didn't know that dj life um, you go into mm-hmm. photography. Where does K Swiss come into play? Like, at what point did they come into your life and you know make that offer, or vice versa? You found them and you you came across their brand and what they were doing. Yeah, that's an awesome question. In 2016, I want to say somewhere right around there, uh, K Swiss was kind of starting the re process that you're seeing right now, and they had this program called the Board. So the board was an open thing where you can get a, where they chose a hundred creatives around the world to help rebrand K Swiss, and at the head of the board was uh, Diplo. <laughs> so when Diplo tweeted it, and me being uh, into music, I had a couple friends, Christian and Aaron, um, like two of my really good friends, and they said, "Yo, did you see that tweet Diplo did for K Swiss? We think you should do it." So I looked at it, and I was like, "Oh shit, yeah, I'm totally like I'm all about this." K-Swiss, you know, mm-hmm. classic shoe. Why wouldn't I want to do something with K-Swiss and Diplo? So um, I put a bunch of things together and made a little video reel, like a submission. And if you, like, Google Omar Prestwich, K-Swiss, the board, Vimeo or whatever that platform is, because I didn't put it on YouTube, um, you'll find that submission video. So that's how I got introduced to K-Swiss in 2016 years ago. And... Um, yeah, it was almost like a fluke. 
Oh, shout out to Diplo for that, huh? Yeah, yeah. Shout out Diplo. I love that. So now, so you did that, and what what happened next after you submitted that? So um, what happened with that was I just kind of ran with it because I thought to myself, I'll never have another opportunity like this again, and which I learned was completely false. But um, I just did everything I could: shoe designs. Uh, even I don't know how to. Sh- do shoot designs with taglines and then I started thinking all right if their angle is entrepreneurship what do I envision that to be and so I actually got super lucky but a one-on-one photo shoot with Todd Peterson who um, and this is I lived in Utah at the time so Todd Peterson owns this company called Vivint V-I-V-I-N-T and they are a billion dollar company so he was the youngest billionaire in Utah, and I got a one-on-one to shoot photos with him. So I ordered shoes from K Swiss. What does what his company do? Uh, now they do home automation and solar. So you can even like they're a publicly traded company. So like I was, um, I've known him for years because I worked with him in college doing like door-to-door sales. And so with Todd, at you know this time, I'm like, all right, if entrepreneurship is what they're going to go for, like this is how, in my opinion, like the modern entrepreneur looks like he showed up in this crazy energy efficient um, Lamborghini, like something like so forward thinking because he's all about like efficiency and energy saving. So here's this 42 year old badass, like literally like a Richard Branson, but younger, just no rules kind of guy. And I put Swiss on him and I shot photos of him and, you can still find some of those there and maybe I'll just share some after this, like in the next week. Um, but I took photos of him and just ran with the program as how I saw fit. I like, for example, this never happened, but I thought, all right, part of the program was to do a give back portion. How would you give back to the community? And Diplo does these, um, what are they called? Mad decent block parties. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but they're yeah, massive. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I actually caught. I freaking pulled some strings, and I wish this would have happened, and it never did because it would have kicked ass. There, um, there was a company in Utah at the time that's that was called People Water. So for every water bottle you bought, they would donate a water bottle or help create like these um, water uh, wells. Yep, containers, things. yeah, to help for clean drink water and an area. Yeah, so like heard of those. Yep. So I don't think they're in business anymore, but I reached out to them and I got a hold of like basically the main dude that's in charge of these kind of um, collaborations. And he agreed to give me um, some stupid deal on water bottles to get them dirt cheap. And the plan was to get all of these water bottles at Matt decent block party. So the only way that you could drink, like, you know how they sell water bottle, mm-hmm. it'd be through people water. So mm-hmm. that way people, you know, spend two, three bucks on a water bottle, but it was just like helping do all this stuff. And then I went above and beyond. And with the money that we were going to raise with the water bottles, because I worked out the deal that we could keep like all the, all the profit. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a friend who was helping build a hospital in Africa and he got me in touch with the people like the main, main, main people. And they said, Hey, look what we need is supplies. And this is how much money it would take. So I was like crunching numbers and thinking if we sell X amount of water bottles at these mad block parties, we could pay for X amount of hospital equipment. And they agreed to put K Swiss's logo. Wow. Like, on. And it never happened. Like, I literally was like pulling strings, making calls. Like, how do I what make this happen? What was the X factor? What, what, why do you uh, think? They just, it, they, because at the end of every, um, with the board, you had an assignment. And at the end of the assignment, they would review what everyone did and pick the winner. Mine never won. Like, Done. I never won anything. <laughs> but that one idea, to this day, I'm like, shit, I could have done so much good. Like, yeah. insane. Um, if everything cools down with Corona. Maybe we could do a, a, a <laughs> private. I'm I'm dead serious. Maybe we could do like a private event, have a DJ, make it like fundraiser focus, and you could call up those people to make it happen. That yeah, that would be insane. And I think I know some people that can make, and you know some people too. Um, but yeah, so that um, that's what happened with the board, and then it just kind of vanished. Like nothing. 
I never heard from K-Swiss. I never like, like, what the fuck? Or, mm-hmm. You know, what was going on? Right. Um, right, be- right before it ended, um, like a month before the, because pro- it was like a summer intern kind of feel, but it was mm-hmm. all online because there's people from all over the world. Um, I did something that to this day, I don't know why, but I decided, um, hey, E3 is going on. I have a free pass to E3. And if I'm going to be in California for E3, why don't I also visit K-Swiss? And this is before the office is at there are now. So I actually just sent an email and said, hey, I'm going to be in California. I'd love to visit you guys. Mm. So they never had anyone do this. And so I just showed up with my crew. Like I had a videographer and my homie, Christian, um, who actually now produces our podcast, which is really cool. Um, but we went to the original case was headquarters and where was that? It's, I can't remember way far out. It was in LA or was it? It was in California. It was like two hours away from Los Angeles. It was like way North. Really cool. Uh, very country club feel. Uh, but that was like really interesting because I remember walking in there. I had like long hair, like almost down to my shoulders. There was a picture of me like on the wall Um, I remember that someone recognized me and they were like, oh, you're Omar, you do what you love. Like, that was my thing. Like, I do what I love. (laughs) Um, So that was like really powerful and motivating because in the future, I realized the power of not being afraid to show up at someone's door when you've given a lot of value. And I never asked for anything. I was just like, I wanted to see this. And then after that, nothing ever happened, but I stayed in contact with a few people I think that's a big, that's a great takeaway right there that we should talk about of how um, you provided value without any ask. You were just there because you saw an opportunity, you wanted to take advantage of it, and you knew with your skill set that something could be done. And if not, you were still okay with it because you tried, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and another thing to add on to that is I, you know, I didn't realize at the time, because I was like 25 years old at the time, 26. Um, I didn't realize what value I was giving. I didn't know what value meant. I was just doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was just natural instinct to you. It wasn't like, what can I do or what can I get out of this? It was just more so I wanted to do this. and Exactly. From it. exactly. So timeline now. So it was 2016. You, know, you had gone through that program. You get it. You go through this whole <laughs> online program. Now, where happens between 2016 to 2019? post um yeah post internship that it took you three years to uh come back to the company itself or and land the job like where what i'm missing something what happened yeah no um the best and worst things happened at that time Mm -hmm. um at that time i got fired from a company because i was spending so much time trying to do all these things for (laughs) k-swiss okay Photos, designs, like ideas. And so were you a contracted worker for K-Swiss or are you referring no, to the no. internship? Straight, straight up like, hey, you made it on the board. Every week we're going to email you something. And then every Friday you have to submit it. So it was like homework, weekly homework. Interesting. Yeah, it was six weeks. Every week you got something. Or I think some of them were like two-week projects. But still, it was like just two months. Like and this is months. during your internship or post-internship? This is during the internship thing, yeah. like the board. I just considered it as like an internship, you know, because mm-hmm. you're learning how to do things. I never right. like it. It was like pre-recorded videos that they email you. It was a private link to YouTube. And mm-hmm. then like, you never really interacted with anybody. It was so weird. Mm-hmm. Um, the most interaction I had with them was when I went there. But um, what happened at that time after was what changed my life. First, I got fired from the job I was working because I was spending too much time on K-Swiss, and this was at a startup, so they needed me to like be more active. It was a screen printing design, screen printing and um, graphic design startup. Um, I was for sure, I was still in college at the time, deciding if I was gonna drop out. And so within like a year, I had been, I became a college dropout, uh, I got fired from my job, and I had my girlfriend dump me. <laughs> That's a lot. What college did you go to? I was going to Utah Valley University. Okay. That's, where a, my friend, that's a lot. Where my friend Austin built his company of a backpack that you know called Wandered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that back. That backpack is equivalent to my iPhone. It's always with me. 
<laughs> legit it's always with me i know i saw it on your video the other day it was awesome i'm telling you it's always with me it carries everything i need so uh to not get off track because i know yeah. we could yeah. we can talk about anything and everything so uh this year now so your girlfriend decides to uh, go on to another life and yeah do thing and you know you lose your job due to your dedication with k-swiss which makes so much sense when you're a startup <laughs> they need everyone to be all in and at that time you were like two feet in both ponds, right? Yep. Or one foot yep. in each pond is the term. Yep. And you drop out, which yeah. for most people, and what year was this? This is 2016 when I think. When, I was like, yeah, 2016, that, that's still the year. I would say like around 2018, being a dropout was considered cool, right? Like on social media and everything. 2016, <laughs> it was like, what are you doing? What are you really doing? Dude, that- you know, and my parents and everyone, hence, like, the truth is, like, what was I doing? I was a 27-year-old without an associate degree, trying to do a record label, trying to work at a startup, trying, you know, to do 20 million things and still, you know, I don't know what the fuck was going on. So it kind of made sense that everything kind of collapsed. And that was an opportunity for me to really, like, okay, what am I doing? What do I mm-hmm. want to do? And so I took complete ownership and that's when my whole life changed. The case was seen, came and went, never heard from them again. I just kind of like learned it. Um, I honed in on design. I honed in on my record label. I got a lot better at taking photos and just being more, you know, being able to just take photos, design, get out there and over and over and make as many connects as I can. And this period was so important for me because I learned how great I was at photography I learned how passionate I was about building a brand with music. And, um, and then I learned that I could multitask and still create. And I started freelancing. That's when I learned, you know, the power of freelancing. So. That's great. And when you're going all through this, you know, you named um, a plethora of jobs that most people are trying to do. I would say most entrepreneurs, right? They're trying to multitask different things and do everything. What was your, aside from the collapse of in kind of school, what was your personal breaking point of being like, hey, let me relax. Let me take a step back to review what I'm doing and hone in on one or two things instead of the record label, the printing of the shirts and anything else you had going on. Yeah. So two key things. Number one, when I, because I had a, I had two major like, oh my God, what the fuck? Um, a big like, what am I doing with my life? Am I really like that pathetic? So that was the first time I really ever in my life was like, whoa, this is a rude awakening. Mm-hmm. Like here I am lost my job and mm-hmm. my wife and what the hell. Mm-hmm. So I focused on just like, you know what, let me just do my record label. And uh, while I work on uh, whatever graphic design and all this stuff on, on the start of side. Yeah. That was the crossroad, the relationship. Yeah. Yep. It was like, you know what, you just, life happens, you deal with it, you take ownership, you move forward. In my opinion, the startup was perfect because I was doing graphic design all day, Mm -hmm. cool shit that I liked. My friends that are in music actually worked there. And so I, you know, we would do, (laughs) we'd do music and design and everything together. So it was perfect for me. And then I could design and print my own shirts. So I was literally getting paid to learn how to design, to print my own t-shirts and learn all the aspect of like an apparel brand. It's perfect. Yeah. So it was like, of course. And then I got fired from that job over just because they couldn't afford to pay me more. And I was like, look, if you don't pay me more, then I'm going to leave. And I ended up getting fired (laughs) the day before my last day over some super petty things that even even now I'm friends with the owner, but he actually like a year after that, he called to apologize because he was like, yeah, that was, that wasn't cool. <laughs> um, I think he was just bummed that I was leaving and I was like, yeah. I did everything photos. But let's talk about that. I think that's really important in the moment. You were probably extremely frustrated. Why is this happening? What's going on? But months later, 24 months later, whatever the timeline exactly is, you have this opportunity now to be the head of social for a massive shoe brand. Yeah, so um, super, I'm super thankful for that. And that was the second time where I was like, okay, 
you know, you think you have, you think you're picking your life up and you think you're moving forward. And Momentum. It was, mm-hmm. at one point you're all fine and dandy flying first class with people. Uh, and I'm not the one paying for it, but you know, you're, you're getting paid to travel. No, the opportunities you're, there. Yeah. Um, you're, these life experiences. Yeah. And then you, you know, the next day you go into the office and you're fired and you're like, mm-hmm. what the fuck? And you're like, right. okay. Um, at this point, the one thing I did wrong and I, I wish I would have planned better was to save money. Mm-hmm. I've been out spending money because I'm like, oh, I've, I'm making money here. I'm making mm-hmm. money here. I want to do all this. And so I was just like going all out. And then I found myself with no job, an apartment that I probably couldn't afford and accumulating debt. Mm-hmm. And so that, at that point, that was when I decided, okay, take one bigger step back <laughs> And you got to eliminate all the shit that you that you don't need in your life, whether that's people, comfort, whatever it is. And so at that point, I decided to leave um, Utah, and then I moved to Seattle. And this is two thousand end of two thousand seventeen, I believe, into two thousand eighteen, right around there. I I don't know the exact dates, but. I didn't have a job, obviously. I just got fired and I didn't have a place to live because I don't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in Seattle. And then I just left. And, you know, I went to Seattle and that was the biggest pivoting point of my life because now I'm a 30 year old, um, (laughs) a 30 year old that has no college degree, is in debt, Mm -hmm. and doesn't have a job. And I found myself within the first, you know, day of living in Seattle and working at Chipotle as a line cook in downtown Seattle. So that, that too, that's where we are in the timeline. 2007, end of 2017, early 2018, I was living in Seattle by myself and I restarted my whole entire career. Mm-hmm. But that was the time that everything changed. And then 10 months, 11 months after that is, where I am now. You're in Seattle, and where did K-Swiss come into play for you now to take that position of head of social? So now I'm in Seattle, and I I got a good resume of, like, I know how to shoot photos, I know how to build brands, and I know mm-hmm. how to hustle, like, boom. So it was the first two weeks were hard because I was working at Chipotle, and then I ended up getting a gig at another startup because, you know, thank God for startups, <laughs> um, where I was doing all their photos and graphic design and blah, blah, blah. So um, I that this is really important because with the startups and me being an entrepreneur, the guy that hired me, he was looking at all my portfolio and all this stuff. And he's like, oh, it looks like you're, you're a big fan of Gary Vee. I'm like, yeah, I'm a major fan of Gary Vee. Um, you know, I met him once, and so that was like our connection. And I always wore K Swiss because, you know, hence the K Swiss thing where they represent entrepreneurship. I had only been wearing K Swiss um, a little bit before that time, like right before I was moving to Seattle, is when K Swiss announced their partnership with Gary Vee. And I was actually, weirdly enough, I was one of the very first people to ever see the original Gary B prototype shoe, which I still, which I have, Barney gave it to me, wow. <laughs> which means the world to me. But um, in the back of my mind, when I was in Seattle and I was just trying to like get a bunch of freelance gigs, that was when I was coming up with ideas and learning how to give value. So I was buying K-Swiss shoes, obviously the Gary V ones and other designs. So I just started learning, teaching myself, I should say, how to shoot photos for uh, like sneaker photos, lifestyle photos. So I was always looking on Instagram being like, okay, this is a cool photo. Let me try to remake this. So I just started taking a bunch of photos, putting them on Instagram. I noticed Case was liking them here and there. Mm. Um, occasionally Barney would like them. Barney's the president of Case Swiss. You know, that, you know, kind of plays a major role in everything um, with me getting there. And then I had this idea that I never got to pitch and I never got to do. But the idea was to um, pitch a 10 track or a 10 video slash track project to K-Swiss and call it Next Up or Up Next, I can't remember. And it was 
I have a bunch of music producer friends that were just on the, they were on the brink of becoming the next big thing or whatever. And three uh, out of the 10 that I decided they, when I say they made it, like they're there already. Yeah. So I was like, all right, 10 different shoes, 10 different tracks. Like with these people, I'm going to go to K-Swiss. I'm going to pitch it. This is how much money I'm going to need for it. And in turn, they get music and photos and like this really cool project. So um, I emailed Barney and completely lied and said, hey, I'm going to be in L.A. this time. <laughs> would, love, <laughs> would love to meet you. And he hits me back and says, um, I think I can do that day. Um, just let me know and I'll make some time for you. So I immediately, as soon as he said yes, I booked my flight. Let me, let, let me, I'm going to cut you off right there because I think, I think the word that you use isn't correct for the opportunity that you created. I don't <laughs> think that's a lie. I think that's someone who, and I mean this because I'll tell you this, I haven't, I, mean, I think I've said it once, maybe. I did the same thing with Elena Cardone. Oh, yes. So I had told her, I was like, hey, I'm going to be down in Miami for some event. And I was like, hey, I'm available Monday between the hours of 11 or Tuesday. It was Monday or Tuesday between the hours of 11 and 3 because when I researched flights, they were like 100 bucks. Yeah. I was like, let me know what time best works for you. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm available at 1 o'clock. I'm like, perfect. I'll be done by 1030. I called my friend and I was like, yo, we need to fly down to Miami. <laughs> and I was like, three days before of whatever it is. And I think that is a great story because you're creating opportunity for yourself. You wanted it so bad that you knew that um, not saying that you were going to be somewhere, but rather that you're creating the opportunity for that person that you want to work with or create a deeper relationship with. Exactly. Um, I love that. This portion of my life will forever. It's just like the most mind blowing um, kind of chain of events that happened within like a one month period um, that for real is like if it wasn't for this one month if it wasn't for everything years before like four years five years of like building a brand learning how to do this getting fired getting divorced dropping out of school everything you could imagine just like all of a sudden like this window of opportunity like showed up mm -hmm. so I booked my flights I again outgrew the company that I was working with and I was getting, I was making more money on the side than I was at my nine to five. So I decided like, look, the proper thing is, is if you guys can't pay me more, let's take a step back and let me actually, um, let me be a contractor mm -hmm. and you guys can be my client. I can still do a my other design. You cool. still get, you know, and so yeah. the win-win all around. Yeah, so that happened, and they said, we'll think about it, which turned into no. I said, whatever, I quit. Again, on good terms. This was like on good terms. Right. But and I also think that's it's just a life lesson where it's understanding that just because it's a no doesn't mean it's a goodbye. And just because that no doesn't mean that there's that friendship has to kill itself. I personally had a similar situation. It was one of my first clients, and she's one of my best friends. And then she had a, she has a cryotherapy business and we still talk every day. We still do business together still to this day. But at that time when I had just started, she had me on a retainer and she was like, Hey, we're going through some stuff this month. We can't afford you and don't take it personal because we can't pay you. And then in my head, when I was young, I just, I was like, how can I not take this personal? You're not paying me. You know, we're right. not going to be doing business together anymore, but it's flipping the switch and understanding that there's a difference between personal and business. They have good intention. They want the best for you. But in the current state of the business, they can't afford what they need you to do. So, right. you know, it's not, I think that's a great point you brought up. It's just understanding that not now, maybe later. And that was the case less than, I think it was like four months later, she gets acquired by this major um, parent company that comes in this uh, hedge fund company. And then I was in airports literally four months later with the work. Yeah. I've never told that story actually either, but thank you. Yeah. This is um, these two stories what you shared and what I just shared. They're so important for two reasons. One, well, I moved to Seattle because I was like, look, if I'm gonna, there was one thing. It was Gary Vee's advice. It was if you're good enough, you win. You will win. That's like that's the only thing that was on my mind when I left Utah. It's like you know what? Fuck these guys. If they think that I'm not good enough, then I'm gonna prove it to everybody. If I'm good enough, I'm gonna win. So. I didn't tell, like, I literally told my family that I was moving to Seattle the day before. I was already, like, packed everything. And then in Seattle, I was all about, like, what am I going to do? What do I want to do? How am I going to do it? Well, it was build my record label. Mm -hmm. How am I going to 
how am I going to build my record label and brand and like support it? And uh, the only, uh, the only way was like, you have to build your own agency, social mm-hmm. media marketing agency that work with each other because then people will hire you based on the work that you do. So that was the, that's where I was at. And then I found myself in this moment. And I remember being in, in a coffee shop at 7am. I always went there first in cherry in Seattle working every fucking morning and i remember seeing k swiss going live with uh barney Mm -hmm. so it was gary and patrick and and barney in new york and they were talking about the new gary v clouds and dirt (laughs) and it was like you could call in and so and oh man it's such a this like i said this month is so wild because a week before like a week or two before when they were doing the crushing it tour around um barney he knew i was a major fan of gary and being the homie i don't know how for reals barney and i's relationship became to be but i remember he texted me one day he said hey are you busy and i'm like no of course i'm not busy like not for you if you get that text message everything yeah. is canceled <laughs> so I, remember, I remember he's like hey, i'm gonna call you up in five minutes just answer and i'm like okay and this is when i worked in you know at this design place in seattle so he calls me up I'm like hey what's up and he goes, hey, what's up, Omar? Um, I got a friend here that wants to say hi to you. All of a sudden, it's Gary. And nice. He's, Omar, my man, hey, Barney told me, like, your support for the brand and the shoes, and I just want to say thank you. And I was like, that was it, you know, nothing else. And I would, that phone call to this day means the world to me because having Barney call me, having Gary say thank you, having both of them say thank you for me was, like, the most validation of, like, dude, Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. And then, like three weeks later, when they're on the when they're in New York and they're doing uh, Ask Gary V about the shoes, I was like just typing away, like asking questions, talking about the shoes. Boom, 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 and they were getting callers. And all of a sudden, fucking internet lag. My phone rings, and I'm like, no way. And I answer it, and. And it's like, I'm on the live. So all of a sudden, I hear Barney and Gary, and they're like, oh, is that Omar? Omar from Utah? And I was like, oh, shit. You know, so then I started talking to them on this phone. My phone cuts out because fucking service. It doesn't matter. I get my, like, one minute of fame, and I'm feeling like, oh, this is amazing. Omar, you want to know that's crazy? I'm getting goosebumps right now. I've seen that interview, and I know Gary's like, hey, Omar, are you still there? Omar, oh, I guess he. I know exactly yes. what you're talking about, because when he went on the the, the show, it was Ask Gary V, um, yeah, CEO of K Swiss. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe this happened. They like they knew who I was, like it was in a whatever weird way, and then um, right after that is when I called or I decided to make the trip to los angeles yeah. yeah so this is like the beginning of june and then um and then i tweeted and i have the tweet and i screenshotted it because i think i did this before i bought the the ticket i don't know but i just said all i want for my birthday is a photo of me barney and gary like that's all i want for my birthday i booked my flight right around my birthday because i have a client in denver yeah, so I have to go to Denver, say what up, catch up, do all these things. I'm going to Los Angeles right after that because I'm going to meet up with Barney. And then right before that, I, I'm going to Utah because I haven't seen my family in a year. So okay. I want to go say hi. Go to Utah, talk to my family, telling them everything that's going on, like amazing you know, things. I'm starting my, my own agency. I'm going to meet with Barney. I'm going to pitch this. I, I, you know, I'm telling them everything that's going on. Um, and Barney says, Hey, I, um, I have a plus one to go to this, uh, weed. What is it called? It was uh, some investment thing with weed and Gary it's for Gary's new company. If you want to come, I'm like, hell yeah. And he said, so you have to come a day earlier. So I'm like, shit, um, let me move my flights. So I think what I I didn't, something happened, but I ended up going from Utah to LA and not to Denver. Like I was like, I'll figure out the Denver thing in a, like in the mix. So 
I go to you. I go to Los Angeles one day earlier to meet with Barney, and I get to meet Gary Vee again. And this is the day after my birthday. This is all in the same month, all June. And what do you know? Like it happens. I get the photo one day after my birthday. It's me, Gary, and Barney, and Tyler Babin, who used to work, you know, with Gary. And I have the 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 freaking selfie in that elevator, being like, "Oh my god, I can't believe this happened." This is like a dream come true, blah, blah, blah. I'm like rubbing shoulders with Gary, but I'm not like fanboying at this time. I was like, this guy's just a regular dude mm-hmm. feeling it. And it, like even inspired me more on how just real he was. Yeah. But the reason why that's so important was when I went upstairs to like get some air and I was at Barney, he was like, so Omar, like, what do you do? <laughs> and that turned into, well, I, you know, I create social media uh, content and I build brands. And, and he said, oh, I thought you did music. I'm like, well, I did or do do music. I do that on the side, but I'll yeah, do but, but no, but it's the truth. Like, yeah, at nights I'm, you know, going out to shows. I'm taking photos. I'm still, like, trying to DJ whatever run a apparel. In fact, I'm wearing one of our shirts. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and he said, oh, it's interesting. I thought you always did music. I'm like, well, yeah, but like I got to pay bills and I do that through building social media. And then he said, oh, well, you know, we've been looking for someone like this. And I was like, interesting. I'm like, did, so I said, did you find the guy? And he said, well, I don't know about that, but why don't you come into the office tomorrow and uh, let's just talk about this. So that's where everything changed because I canceled my flight and I went home right after I went to my friend's house right after that meeting or that situation. And I made a deck like why they should hire me. Here's your current creative. Here's the captions. This is what I think is wrong or how I can improve it. Here's new captions that I've made. And I just like did this thing, but it's like they know who I was or who I am. They've seen my photos. I've been sending them photos for years now for free. In fact, some of the early photos on the case with Instagram, like some of the very first, first photos are mine. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then that turned into an interview and another window of opportunity happened and I just fucking took it, you know? It, and with no, with no guarantees, it was like, hey, we're not guaranteeing you a job. We'll give you a, I think they said 60 day or 90 day trial. You're a contractor and they were paying me like nothing. Mm -hmm. And because I was a contractor, um, they couldn't pay for me to relocate. So here in Seattle, I'm just barely getting out of debt. (laughs) I've got no money. And I'm like, fuck, here we go again. You know, I have to get out of this contract. I have to like pack up all my stuff and I have to move to Los Angeles and find a place to live within like two weeks because that's when they wanted me to start. That's when Clouds and Dirt was launching. Mm -hmm. I did everything in one week. I canceled my Denver trip. I flew back home, packed up everything I needed to, got rid of everything I needed to, packed up a U-Haul and showed up to K-Swiss one week before I needed to start working. And... Fast forward, and I'm, you know, the K-Swiss community manager and continue to do the best that I can every day. I love it, man. That story is just amazing. It it really is. It just shows the dedication and the focus that you had on staying true to what you wanted and things aligning itself. You know, that Gary V phone call, that's what I like to call. So anyone listening there, oh, whoop-de-doo, Gary V told him thank you and showed him love for 10 seconds and but it's the bigger picture of who it came from and at the timing of your life, of where your focus and attention was, which was K-Swiss, Barney, and Gary Vee motivating you yep. every single day, right? Yep. So now I'd love to talk about you know, the creative direction of the brand and the collaborations you guys have done in the past 24, not even 24 months, less than 16 months. <laughs> um, there's, there's been so many. Every time I see one launch, like two weeks later, it's like, boom, another big hitter. Um, aside from Gary Vee himself obviously coming on and being what I would say a big face for the brand and push for the brand, 
Um, I would love to talk about how, you know, you guys, one of your latest ones, the ones that caught my attention, it was nostalgic, was the Ghostbusters shoe. <laughs> yes. Um, so these collaborations, um, right when I got to K-Swiss, they had just gotten some sort of um, partnership with Sony and Universal to you like licensing rights for a few different movies or yeah. whatever. And so they just picked a few different projects and Ghostbusters is one of them. It was Ghostbusters, Clueless, The Matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, those are kind of like the major, major ones that I can think of at the top of my head. But um, we, you know, we got the rights to use it to make a shoe and the designer that was chosen was perfect. And then we were like, all right, how do we like <laughs> make this come to life and like really do something different because I think Bape at the time was also doing a collaboration. And for people that are listening to create a shoe, it takes 18 months. So wow. yeah, so the license was forever ago and the process of making it was like, you know, a year. And so, um, yeah, so that was an interesting project and we got to shoot Dan Aykroyd at Ghost Corps and create like an That's unboxing so video cool. with him. He was so funny, all business from one place to the next. And then um, side story, but I was so hyped for meeting him that day and like, oh my God, I can't believe I got to meet Dan Aykroyd and like take photos of him and K-Swiss and everything, you know, mm -hmm. that um, that next night uh, I, or two nights after that, I went to... Uh, the Quentin Tarantino movie theater. Yeah. Um, on Beverly or whatever it is with my homie Santi. And we we're like going to watch the midnight showing of Blues Brothers because we're like, dude, Dan Aykroyd, we got to go watch this film. It's a cult classic. And when we were like walking over there, he was like, oh, I, I had this dream that Dan Aykroyd showed up to the movie theater and um, Quentin Tarantino also showed up too and we got to kick it with them. So we're sitting there waiting for the movie to start and fucking Quentin Tarantino comes out. What, like, what the hell? Granted, it, it is his movie theater, but you know, wasn't expecting that. So he's talking about the movie and he says, why am I talking about it? Why don't we just get Dan to talk about it? So then Dan Aykroyd comes out and he just like comes from the back and he's like, like, what the hell? So Dan Aykroyd and Quentin Tarantino were there two nights after that. I thought that was really amazing. And so once the shoe dropped, for me, it was that much more impactful because I got to meet him in his office. I got to see him, like, cut loose in a movie theater. And then I met him a, a little after that when we did a pop-up event. But that whole event was amazing. Um, and that strategy, I don't know, I think you asked me about strategy, but... Barney calls it the spark strategy, which is you keep putting out these iconic pop culture moments mm -hmm. with not a lot of shoes and it gets people's attention. And you do that enough over and over and over. And like you said, man, I keep seeing you guys put this new shoe or this collab or whatever it is. And it's to keep, it's to keep getting your attention because ultimately what really makes money for K-Swiss isn't Ghostbusters. It's the case was classic. It's the one shoe that, you know, sells over and over and over and over. And so, um, like Breaking Bad, that was massive, right? It's just... Amazing. Yeah, just to give people some limelight, name a few campaigns you've done in the past 12 months. So Ghostbusters, uh, which was the Stay Puff Man shoe and the Slimer shoe, Breaking Bad, we've done... Are you able to, are you able to touch on how many sh shoes sold? Like a generic? Yes. Okay, yeah, great. So... Because shoes take forever to make, and especially the, the special project ones, we don't make a lot of shoes. We make like 300 to 500 pairs. Unless other companies like Foot Locker are going to buy them, we'll make like 1,500 pairs. Still not a lot. Like we want to keep them limited so they sell out, obviously, and then people can resell them. Um, so like Breaking Bad, the very first one that we did, we only did 300 pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. And they sold out in like 20 minutes. Okay. 
Now, when something like that happens, do you guys plan to release more, or, is it, or just that's it? Is that so, is that the market strategy for K Swiss? Hey, let's make three hundred sell out, and then as you just said, like have people resell them, and then that's it. Um, with quick drops, the the strategy is just to make K Swiss as relevant as possible and get it in front of as many eyes because really that's that's the thing, you know. We're not we're not a hype beast kind of sneaker. That's that's just facts. <laughs> you know, we're we're not selling out like an Air Jordan is. And so right. uh, when we get those little wins, it's really important for us, you know, because you know, that's it's not very common that and truth be told, right? It's not very common that a K Swiss sneaker sells out. I think the first one that ever did that from I'm sure they maybe had some in the past, but the Gary V O one and O two. That yeah. sold out fast and crashed the K-Swiss internet or the website. Yeah. Um, other than that, it was just, you know, the Breaking Bad sneaker. Um, and that was a good example. That was the first time I saw even someone like almost fist fighting for the sneakers, which I thought was cool. Um, and then, so, yeah, so we got Breaking Bad. We had Ghostbusters. We have, obviously have Gary V's. What else? We did Clueless. Um, we did The Matrix. We just did Boys in the Hood. Uh, those are the major collaborations. And then now we have a new entrepreneur that we're working with. And for, I don't know how much of creatives listen to this audience or whatever. Hopefully they know this name, but Chase Jarvis. Mm -hmm. he is, it, yeah, he is like... Um, for context for people that don't know who he is, who is that? So Chase Jarvis is a world-renowned um, photographer and entrepreneur. He owns um, a company. It's an online learning platform called Creative Life. He does a podcast called the, I think it's Daily Creative or the Chase Jarvis Live Show. He um, essentially built the first Instagram. It was called like um, Camera Phone or something like that. Phone, I can't remember. But in his book, Creative Calling, you hear that whole entire story. And I remember that app. So before Instagram was Instagram, there was an app that you take photos and do filters and stuff like that. And that was his app. Um, and now, you know, he's done campaigns for Nike, Apple, Nikon, you name it. Like he's the action sports photographer, kind of behind the scenes guy. And now his whole thing is to help people find their inner creative and build the life that they want. And so um, we are going to do, we just started working on a project with him. And so that for me is massive because um, I was the one that brought him to the table and it's been like six months trying to get those papers signed and they finally yeah. got signed. And thank God it happened before the whole like situation that we're in happened because we're still able to make, get that project moving. So you'll probably see that happen at the end of the year, but that's, that's awesome. a collab that we have. That's great. What would you say, what would you give advice to any creative that's lost right now? What would you tell them? Two things. Um, don't stop creating. Number one, you know, don't stop creating because if you stop creating, you have more time to probably focus on the bad. <laughs> um, find ways to be creative and create for maybe, maybe create for brands that you'd like to create, even though they're not hiring you. But this is an opportunity to create opportunity. <laughs> opportunity to create opportunity. Um, because if, and I was literally thinking about this today, and right before you and I talked, I posted it. But it was, what an awesome time to reflect on your life. Are you really happy with it? If, if shit was about to go down right now and everything before today is what your life consists of, that's your quote unquote legacy, like, does that make you happy? Mm. And if the answer is no, then take this time to think what you can do different moving forward. Do you want to, do you want to be a, do you want to say, I don't want to work in this industry anymore. I want to do something else and start, start taking the time to learn those things so you can be better prepared for whatever happens in the future. So that's like the number one piece of advice. Don't stop creating and create for companies or brands that you would love to work for. You're amazing, Omar. Omar, where can people find you? What's the best platform link? No, I'll put Omar the stuff in the description. Presto. 
everything Omar Presswitch. So Instagram, obviously, I'm super active at Omar Presswitch. Twitter at Omar Presswitch. Do you have a TikTok uh, yet? I do, but I uh, fuck. At yeah, Omar Presswitch. <laughs> everything Omar Presswitch. I just figure, like, I want people to find me and I want to help as many people as I can. And why, yeah. why is it confusing? I'm a one of a kind guy. Yeah. <laughs> so Omar Presswitch it is. Omar, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I appreciate you telling your story, um, giving great insight and just valuable uh, life lessons of going after what you want and not letting anyone or anything tell you otherwise. Appreciate you and appreciate the opportunity, man. Thank you.